Good morning. It is great to be with you in God's house. If you were here a few minutes early and you heard music playing and then there was more music playing after the chiming of the hour, then you're not wrong. That's what was happening. And the reason is I'm convinced what we need to hear right now is this space filled with music. And so before every worship service for the foreseeable future, we're going to have, it's not really a concert, but just music being played, filling these halls with sound for us to sit, to reflect, to enjoy. And uh, more than the spoken word, I think we need to hear the music of the Lord. And so come a few minutes early and you'll hear different people will play each week and uh, it'll be great. Just by a few way of announcements, so a few want you to be aware of. You can read inside your bulletin. There's a lot of dates that we're starting to put in front of you, and it's a very good thing. Church is starting to fill back up again, and we want you to be aware of what is coming. Save the date for May the 5th. This is going to be a called business meeting, a Zoom business meeting, uh, so completely online. Uh, but we have, one, uh, we have one thing we are discussing, and that is the potential of First Baptist building a columbarium. So a lot of conversation can be had that night. Uh, You're going to hear kind of the energy that's been put in up to this point and then to see if we want to invest financially into moving forward. Uh, And so we have a motion of we want uh, $11,000 is needed uh, to survey the land and to start with architectural uh, uh, plans. We are not have not approved that. That's the point of the meeting. So we're going to have conversations about if this is what we need to do. Are we ready to do this? And uh, so if you want to be a part of that conversation, May the 5th, 6 o'clock on Zoom. Also save the date for May the 23rd, which is Pentecost. We are going to have a one worship service that day. Hopefully, weather permitting, we will be outside. And this is going to be, it's Pentecost. So we're all going to wear red and we're going to share in communion together for the first time in person in over a year. And we're going to also have a bunch of people making red velvet little cakes for you as well that you can take with you. And so it is a birthday party for the church, and we're going to celebrate it together outside in the preschool parking lot. If it rains or there is a chance of rain, we'll just bring it in here. But we'll do one worship on May the 23rd uh, at 10 o'clock. So set that on your calendars. Also, we are starting to get quite a bit of feedback from our gathering in-person survey that went out over the weekend. One of the things that is increasingly obvious is that you like it when someone is smiling at you at the door. We aren't going to hand anything out. We'll still have tables that have the bulletins on it and hand sanitizer stations, but we are asking that we have greeters, and your whole job is to welcome people. Just say hi. You can smile if you want, but we won't know that. And... uh, but to welcome and greet people on their way in. If you would like to be a greeter, contact our church office and we'll get into a rhythm of getting people signed up. And so all you're doing is standing at the door and welcoming people as they come in. I would also like to say, if you you haven't known this yet, I am now completely vaccinated. And so if you would like a pastoral visit at your house or outside or in my office, let's do it. It is time to set those up. I would love to come and meet you where you are. So if there is a need for a pastoral visit, just to sit, to talk, to listen, I'll be glad to do it. And I would want to offer that as a service to you. So just let me know. You can contact me directly and we can set up a time that works best. And then finally, our Easter offering is doing great. We are almost at 7,000. We have a couple weeks left, but we're trying to reach 10. Uh, And so you can see all of the mission partners that we are partnering with locally and internationally. Uh, And if you look in our soundings, there's even more detail about what each of those dollars will be going to. Uh, So that is a couple more weeks that we have that you can still give to that. If you have any questions, just contact our church office. So much good is happening right now. Uh, Being able to gather in person with you is also good. So let us continue as we worship together as we go to God in prayer. Everlasting God, this time of worship is for you. This moment is for us to offer our praise back to you. Help us experience your grace anew. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray together. Everlasting God, so much of this world does not feel everlasting. It feels like things break far too quickly. Relationships end. Lives come to an end more and more every day. It seems like the finite seems to be much more prevalent than the infinite. But yet you step into our world and dwell among us as the infinite. And we are cast back and forth from realizing that we are finite, but you are not. That our lives are short, but your presence is long. And that we get to worship a God that is always with us. Help us to hold that in the midst of what feels to be just a shortness of breath of this life. Where things move so quickly. Where things end so abruptly. We still have a God who sits with us, waits with us for eternity. Holding that in balance seems to be one of the greatest gifts we could receive. And we feel that infinite nature when we gather in worship. And we hear it. It's almost timeless to us now when we say the same prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. For Amen.
you stand for the reading of our New Testament? This is from 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to just read the first three verses, 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we've said and as we've just heard from the choir, we are light, albeit we're a dim reflection. But we are light. When I was in college, I read a Christian book that challenged me to be the moon, or at least to be like the moon. And the thought was this, the moon reflects the sun. It absorbs the light from the sun and then reflects it into the dark. So those who are in the dark of night, they may not be able to see the sun. They may not be able to feel the rays or the warmth of the sun, but they can see the moon. They can look up into the black of night and see a dim reflection of our greatest source of light. The same is true for Christians. We aren't Jesus. I hate to tell you, you're never going to be either. But we can be like the moon. We can absorb the warmth of the light of Christ. And people who can't see God, they can look into the dark night of their soul and they can see us. We could be a friend, a companion along the way. And it's precisely at that moment that we need to be ready to be the moon. Isn't that a great thought? I first read that from Max Licato. He has a little book called It's Not About Me. I read that in college, and this idea has stuck with me ever since, all these years later. What's underneath this metaphor that we're called to be the moon? It, what's underneath is that we as Christians have a job to do. After we believe, after we confess that God is the source of all light and that Jesus is the sun, I mean S-O-N obviously, but in this metaphor the S-U-N as well, after we come to believe that, then we have a role to play. We are to reflect the sun's rays, to absorb the light and then shine it into the world. So those who are trapped in the dark of night... They can see a great light. Now last week we learned that an early church has emerged as the Johannine community. It's a hub of house churches sprouting up and their core belief is Jesus Christ is Lord. But a threat has emerged and they're teaching that this new threat is teaching that we don't have to take seriously the construct of sin. And they're even dismissing it as relevant at all. So the elder of the church hub pens the letters to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. These letters are full of declarative statements about what this community should believe and what it can hold fast to. The biggest of the doctrines we explored last week What role does sin play in our lives? You have to get this framework right to understand the depth of 1 John because the language circles around the nature of sin. But there is a second. There's another wrinkle that's just as important to this community. This faith community truly believes 
Jesus will return in their lifetime. And that frames what they worry about and their language that they use about church and life and how they're going to live in community together. Their language is dictated by this belief that Jesus will return. Now, I'll show you some of the language in 1 John chapter 2. If you look at verses 18 and 19, you'll hear this. Just listen to this language. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. For this we know, it is the last hour. And they went out from us because they didn't belong to us. If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that they don't belong to us. The elder is talking about this detracting group. They who have gone after the world, he says. They're led astray by the Antichrist. They should have remained in the light, but they chose darkness. We know better. We have to choose the light. We will know we are really following God because we will be a reflection of God's light, like the moon. And you will know that you are in the light because you will be that reflection. This is the language that leads us to our lesson today. And you really do have to hold the fact that Jesus was in their minds coming back. The world was supposed to end a hundred years after Jesus. The world did not, though. Jesus was supposed to reign over everything, and it was going to happen any minute. But it didn't happen. So everyone in that community was supposed, as best they could, every day that they lived their life, hold on to the light, avoid the dark. Jesus is coming. Everyone be ready. And that's when you get verses like 1 John 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When He is revealed, we will be like Him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. You really feel the weight of these words when you put them into its context. They had such hope. Jesus was coming back. He's going to make the crooked paths straight. He's going to shine a light to expose all the evil that's trapped in the dark. So we must be people who remain in the light. It's incredibly endearing to hear these words with such passion and belief. But we need to add into the conversation that the world didn't end. That's the elephant in the room. Jesus hasn't returned fully yet. It's 2,000 years later and things have gotten a little more complicated. So what do we do with this entire letter and these words that were written so matter-of-factly that the world was coming to an end? It kind of feels like 1 John is somewhat out of date. My answer to that is you have to learn to read Scripture contemplatively. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again probably until I die. Scripture has layers. The easiest, most simplistic and literal reading of Scripture is always the lesser reading. So once you get the context and you see the playing field of what's taking place in Scripture, you have to then take the words inward to that next level to go deeper into scripture and allow it to speak into your soul and that's when you can read scripture devotionally in no way 
did the elder of 1 John have you in mind? In no way could he have comprehended First Baptist Waynesboro 2,000 years later who are lifting up the words that he pens to his community. In no way was this letter intentionally written for us. He was not thinking about us. But the Holy Spirit is. And the Holy Spirit can use these words to guide us even into our context. And what I hear the Spirit saying is, the call to be God's light in the dark is still valid. The call to seek out a community that bears God's light and shines God's light, that's still needed. The world is still stuck in darkness. I don't feel like that's changed in 2,000 years. And we are now the light, all of us, albeit we're a dim reflection. But we are light. And what we can do is be the moon for people stuck in the dark. But in the 14 years that I've been pastoring churches, the one thing that keeps reoccurring for me is people don't really believe they're God's light. When it comes to their own private relationship with God, they carry this myth that they were actually born in darkness, that they are evil. But that's a lie. It's a lie that either the church has taught them wrongly or that culture has convinced them of, but which in ever case that they may have been taught this or whatever frame or voice that they had heard this, that's what's wrong. We are not pure evil. We are a reflection of God's light. It just might be a little dimmer than you anticipated. But that light is inside of us. And Jesus died on the cross so we could see it and feel it and claim it and even share it to the world. But I'll grant it, life and time and even sin and I'd argue bad theology have covered this light up in people. But that doesn't erase the fact that it's still in there. Our kids this morning sang with Miss Janice this little light of mine and the verse that you don't put your light under a bushel basket. No, you let the light shine. Just because you may have put your light under a bushel basket doesn't mean there's not a light under there. So when I hear the elder and the writer of 1 John, what I hear him saying or at least what I think if he were here today in our church, what he would pin to us, I think he would say something like this. Be the moon. Absorb as much light from God as you can and then reflect it into the dark and do it every single day. Help others see God in their own life. Give people a reason to hope who don't feel like they have one. Stop following the trends of the world. Stop giving yourself to worldly pleasures. Stop lying. Stop coveting. Stop thinking life is only about you. Stop thinking money is going to solve your next problem. Stop hating yourself. Stop hating others. Stop ridiculing. Stop bullying. Stop doing evil. Stop hoping evil on others. Stop hurting others with your words. And be a neighbor. Love your enemy. Spend more time with your family. Give what you have to give to those who need it. Worship. Lead a life of gratitude. Be rooted in a life in Christ in your own body. Love deeply. Give graciously. Do justice. Love kindness and walk humbly. Pay for someone's meal. Just pay anything to something and pay it forward. Give things you don't need away. Be kind. Share joy. Listen to someone's pain. Offer forgiveness. Tell someone they are loved. Smile more. Listen well. Hug people. Give someone a thumbs up. Encourage and bless. Bless everyone you can because every person you come in contact with is dealing with something dark on the inside everyone is experiencing dark nights of the soul 
everyone carries shame and regret or failure or overexposure or ridicule or self-doubt, and everyone fears that they're not measuring up. And what they need is someone who's willing to shine a light into the midst of that dark and to guide them. Even if it's a dim reflection of the sun, they need a light. Because the light you give, it will be enough for them to get through their night. It will be enough for them to get to the next day. In every act of kindness, in every blessing and encouraging word, in every support or love that you give, in every moment of solidarity that you offer to the universe, more light shines, more people see, and more darkness gets exposed. And that's exactly what we're called to be as a church. And we're supposed to be that way until Jesus returns. We are God's light. So what does 1 John have to say to you today? Just that. You are a light that people in the dark need to see. So go and shine it. People need your light because you are light, albeit you're just a dim reflection. But you're still light. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. If you take anything away from today, just be the moon. I think you really should pull that apart in your own life. I think it really works. It's kind of cheeky and cheesy, but it also, I think, has a lot of depth to it as well. In what ways is your life reflecting the light of God? That is a powerful challenge for us to think about as we step into one more hymn together. We're going to stand and sing, and this is our time of response. If you would like to speak with me, I'll be standing down front. Would you join us as we stand together and sing?
Depart now in peace, knowing the God of all creation is loving and gracing and redeeming you still. Go in peace.